Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. All right. Thank y'all so much for joining us this morning. We're so glad to be here with you. Uh, just a quick temperature check. Who came from the furthest to get here? The furthest to get here. Who came from the furthest to get here? I know we got, where you came from? New York, New Jersey. They got y'all? All right, we got, okay, so what states we got now? So we, got, uh, we got New York, New Jersey. We got Washington, D.C. Jacksonville, Florida is in the house. Who else? Texas. What part? Houston, Texas. Okay. Goose Creek. <laughs> we always got one. Thank y'all so much for joining us. We're so glad to be here. This is the sixth annual landowner, rural and land, limited landowner symposium. I am Rajon Lewis. I'm the guy who's been sending you all these emails and messages and posts and all kinds of things. I'm just so happy to finally be here today and to be able to, to work with you all um, and have this, this great day. Just I want to get started with a, a few housekeeping items just so you know, so we can uh, orient ourselves both here and in um, and. Uh, virtually. So first thing, internet access. Thanks to the kindness of the Center for uh, Airs Property Preservation, uh, we have um, access for each of you who are here. If you need to use devices for whatever reason, um, there should be um, cards right in front of you with, um, your, with your access number on it. Um, if you don't have it, um, it's capital M-A-R-R-I-O-T-T, -T, Marriott 2021. So that's, the, that's the, the password if you need it. All right, real secure, right? <laughs> uh, restrooms, if you need to use restrooms, they are right across the hall. Um, so if at any time you feel the need to go, please don't, don't feel that you don't have to, that you had to hold it or whatever, I don't know. And then uh, Hoover, right? Who's, been, who's gotten on the app? Raise your hand if you got on the app. Very good. So both for, for everyone who's here and those who are watching virtually, um, that's the most direct way to really communicate and engage with this symposium. Um, I just want to show you a couple slides that'll let you know um, a little bit about the app. So when you go into the main screen, this is how it looks from your computer. Um, if you are not on a computer, if you're using it from your phone, it looks slightly different, but it's the same elements. Um, you'll see that the agenda is the first thing that you'll notice. The agenda is, it'll let you know what's coming up, when the breaks are, it lets you know um, what speakers are involved, it lets you know all the kind of things about, about the event. So if you want to know what ha what's happening at 4.30, then you'll know exactly what's happening at 4.30, which we'll be talking about in a second. Um, you'll, also note, you'll also note the sessions are individually listed as well as the speakers. And then when you see attendees, you can actually um, find all the people that are attending this workshop both virtually and in person. And so if you notice a name that it's like, I always wanted to talk to that person, this is your opportunity to find that person and message that person and say, hey, I am your biggest fan. I would love to meet with you for coffee one of these days. Boom, done and done. All right, um, the last thing I wanted to mention on Hoover is the speed networking. All right, so at 4.45, after our 4.30 session, we're gonna have a break that's gonna be an opportunity for us to go ahead and get checked into hotels, those of, those of us who have hotel rooms, but it's also gonna be our virtual networking opportunity. So what I like to think of it as is speed dating for business, right? It's speed dating for business. What's gonna happen is you will be placed into a virtual room with three other people that you do not know, and y'all are gonna talk for 10 minutes and then it's gonna switch you to another set of people. And it does that over and over again for one hour. So in that opportunity, in that period of time, you're able to meet over 18 more people, over 18 people that you wouldn't have met otherwise. Um, there's also a, a prize tied to that, which I'm not gonna talk about. Just, just know we got prizes on deck. So uh, be, be on the lookout for that. Um, be engaged. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be at the back table. And also anybody with the Center for Airs Property Preservation t-shirt, not WCA t-shirt. Airs Property t-shirt or, um, or, or um, Airs Property badge that says a, a staff member, they'll be able to, they'll be able to help you out. Um, and again, my name is Rajon Lewis. Um, with that being said, I want to go ahead and introduce to some and reintroduce to others the great leader of this awesome organization. We can do a standing ovation for my boss, Dr. Jenny Stevens. Good morning. Good morning. Rashawn's trying to get a raise. That's really what he's trying to do. So I'm just saying. <clears throat> Sorry, I started talking. Um, okay. 
So uh, thank you for joining us for our sixth annual Landowner Symposium. I'll say thank you to those of you who are here, as well as to our, our virtual participants. Um, last year, we was, were total, uh, totally virtual, but this year we wanted to make it a hybrid. So let's see how this works. So um, before I get started, you know, we lost a friend, a colleague, a sister, great attorney earlier this year. So can, may we pause for a moment of silence in recognition of uh, Danielle Hope Watson. Thank you. <clears throat> so, oh, wow. Almost about 17 years ago, me along with at least one other person in this room and a couple of other folk, we looked at the issue of land loss, especially among African Americans. And it is a very complex issue. And um, I guess we were all type A personalities because we're like, we're going to solve this. We're going to fix this. We're going to figure out how to do it. And it was truly through partnership that we were able to design a project that eventually became the Center for Heirs Property Preservation. Um, we started this work. And we were only working in four counties. And we would go and do presentations. And folk would remind us, oh, you only work in four counties. Um, but now, fast forward 17 years, we truly are walking out the vision we created in 2010. And that vision was to be the hub for the issue of heirs' property and to be the national leader on the issue. So. Let's give, us, give ourselves a hand because we are progressing towards that. <clears throat> Actually, on yesterday, we were able to announce a partnership with the Mississippi Center for Justice, the uh, Kimberly Clark Corporation, and World Wildlife Fund in creating a, an heirs' property initiative in the Mobile Bay Basin. Um, now, the Mississippi Center for Justice, they already have been providing a lot of education around the issue and even some limited services, especially after natural disasters. But here's an opportunity for us and, you know, how we get calls. We've been receiving calls over those 17 years from many states, from folk who want to know how can you guys help us. And unfortunately, we'd have to say we can't because we don't practice law in those states. But we figured it out. We figured out how to replicate ourselves so that we can share this wisdom that we've learned with other organizations. So we're truly looking forward to working with the Mississippi Center for Justice. And when we started out, we only saw this as a legal services component uh, program, but now we're looking at wealth creation, we're looking at conservation. There are so many aspects to the issue of heirs' property. Let's see. So, um, truthfully, we wouldn't have been where we are now if it had not been for, I'm going to recognize, um, first of all, my team. The team who has um, done so much to make this event what it will be. So I'm asking all of the team members of the Center for Heirs Property Preservation to please stand up. Thank you. And there are a couple who are still out in the hallway. Um, and then I'd be remiss if I did not acknowledge the board members who are here today. Ask that they stand up. Might be only one. Well, current board members and former. How about like, let's do that. Current and former board members, please stand up. 
All right. <clears throat> and then along the way, we created something we called the Woodlands Community Advocate Institute. So all WCAs in the house, stand up. These are our leaders in our community who stepped up and said, hey, um, they've either benefited from the work of the center or just they're our cheerleaders. They believe in what we do and they wanted to make sure their community knew what was going on and how to access our services. So once again, we thank you. Now, I'd be remiss if I did not mention one person who just walked in the door who's a former staff person the notorious <clears throat> Sam Cook. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> Sam was our first director of forestry. Um, now it's led by Steve Patterson. So Sam left it in really good hands. Um, and so, yeah, we've, 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 we really have come a long way. But also, last but not least, thank our sponsors and our supporters. Um, our major supporter is the Natural Resources Conservation Services of USDA. Unfortunately, they are, they are not allowed to travel, but you will hear from her in um, a moment. Or our state conservationist should be clear. Good morning. It's good to be able to speak with you at this sixth annual South Carolina Rural and Limited Resource Landowner Symposium. Thank you, Jenny, for the opportunity to stand before the group today and offer some very brief comments. I'm Ann English, state conservationist with the Natural Resources Conservation Service here in South Carolina. NRCS has the privilege of working with landowners, farmers, and ranchers across the country that have privately owned land. 1.4 billion acres of land is privately loaned in the lower 48 states. Here in South Carolina, 88% of the land is privately owned. Our mission is to work alongside of the producers delivering conservation solutions as agricultural producers can protect the natural resources and feed the growing world. We deliver conservation technical assistance by coming out and walking over your land with you and learning what your goals and objectives are. We will provide you with several alternatives that meet your objectives. NRCS has programs through the Farm Bill that will provide you with financial assistance to establish, to establish practices that helps you meet the need of your, that helps you meet your objectives and protect the natural resources. Some of those programs that we have are the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, the Conservation Stewardship Program, and the Agriculture Conservation Land Easement Program. There are individuals that are in your midst today that have taken advantage of our program. Miss Yvonne, she has used the EQIP program to replant trees, to create wildlife habitat, and also to create fire breaks around her trees. Both Mr. Joe Hamilton and Ms. Mary Hill, they've used our EQIP program to replant trees. So I'm gonna ask you to talk with your neighbor. I'm calling Miss Yvonne, Miss Mary, and Mr. Hamilton, your neighbors. I'm gonna ask you to talk with your neighbors because they have benefited from using our programs. And because they have benefited from using our program, they can tell you about our programs and how it works. Because when you, when you think of it, when it's all said and done, conservation is truly about relationships. And these individuals that I've talked to you about just a few minutes ago, they've been there, they've been through it, so they can, they can tell you about it. But here's the common denominator. I said, it's all about relationships. Each one of these individuals that I mentioned earlier, I met through the Center of Errors property. Now, the Center of Errors property and NRCS, we formed a partnership back in 20, 2012. 
You never know who's going to cross your path on your life journey. Dr. Janet Stevens and I met and had a conversation. When it was all said and done, we were in agreement. There was much work to be done and a partnership was born. Jenny and her staff hosted several meetings and workshops, providing information about Ayers property and inviting NRCS to be at the table to give a presentation about our financial programs and how they could benefit you. Now this allowed NRCS to meet individuals who probably would have never walked through our door. So we still, Jenny and I, we still look for every opportunity there is to collaborate together in order to bring individuals to the table in order to gain knowledge about heirs property and about USDA programs. In closing, I'd like to leave you with these three thoughts to think of when you think about NRCS. We meet people where they are. We'll come out, we'll walk over your property with you, look at it, give you your assessment, but we're coming out to you, we're meeting you where you are. Conservation is about relationships. It is truly about relationships. Had I not met Jenny Stevens, I never would have had an opportunity to learn about the Center for Heirs Property or meet the people that I mentioned and several others that I didn't mention. So it's about relationships. And the last but not least is, we like to say it's in NRCS, we like to help people help the land. And that's by us coming out, walking over your property and giving you viable solutions to help protect your natural resources. And you're protecting that so you can pass your land on to the next generation. Thank you. So we think um, state conservation is Anne English for her words of wisdom and how we've worked together for almost nine years. Um, and it's been truly a, a quote unquote marriage made in heaven. So um, at this time, I have, I wanna thank the other sponsors that have helped make the symposium possible. We already talked about NRCS. The other um, sponsors, and I'll do the USDA cluster first, is the Office of Advocacy and Outreach, better known as the 2501 program for those of you who are familiar with USDA, the National Institute for Food and Agriculture, and the Southern Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education um, program. So those are our USDA sponsors, additional USDA sponsors. Then there is um, Ag First Farm Credit Bank, Enviva, and the South Carolina Sustainable Forestry Initiative Implementation Committee. So please, let's give a round of applause for our sponsors for helping to make, <clears throat> for helping to make today and tomorrow possible for you. All right. Now, I have the pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning. I'm gonna read a little bit of her bio, but truthfully, I could just speak, you know, off the cuff about her because I've known her for a while. So our speaker today is Dr. Faith Rivers James. Professor Faith Rivers James is the Assistant Provost for Leadership at the Citadel. She also serves as a department head and professor of leadership studies. In Rivers, James received her Juris Doctorate at Harvard Law School and her AB from Dartmouth College. I'm gonna stop there, because I know you can read and I won't read to you, but I had the pleasure of reading, meeting, I'll say, Dr. Faith, um, when she was the executive director of the South Carolina Bar Foundation. And I worked at Coastal Community Foundation and we worked closely together um, to facilitate discussions among our local community to develop the project, as I said, that would lead to this work. So truthfully, I'm introducing to you the co-mother of the Center for Ayers Property Preservation and she has done also research around African-American um, land and the impacts of heirs property. So at this time, help me welcome Dr. Faith Rivers James.
Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is great to see all the smiling faces here today and to have you joining us in the virtual world. Uh, it's just good to see somebody else uh, outside my household, right? <laughs> it's nice to gather somewhere else. We've, we've missed all of this. Uh, we were talking this morning saying back in the good old days, we used to be able to get together and go to a conference and, and meet other people. So thank God we were able to uh, gather in this form. And so I want to thank all my friends at the Center for Heirs Property Preservation for the kind invitation to join you today. And uh, as Jenny said, this center is fulfilling a dream of a seed that was planted a long time ago. And Dr. Jenny Stevens and I, we go way back, as the song says. And we've worked together uh, till in this field, and it's so good to see all the fruit that it has borne. And I guess it was about 10 years ago, I met a young lawyer with a kind smile and a dedicated heart in Josh, and it's just been a pleasure to work with him and to see him grow and develop and to take this on as his passion. And so working with Jenny, you know, all things are ordered. And so meeting her and being able to work with her really was a big help and a spark for us. You see, we're both binyas, as we say, down in Charleston and in the low country. And so we knew all too well the stories of black landowners who'd lost their land. And I bet everybody here knows somebody or has a family member who's dealing with the grip of the heir's property conundrum. And so rather than keep wringing our hands about it, we've all come together to do something about it. And as Jenny mentioned, I was thrilled to learn that the Community Foundation and the Trident Urban League were working on these issues way back in the late 90s. And I was at the Bar Foundation at the time, and so our foundation started working together on the issue. Now, who would have thought that the Community Foundation of Charleston, South Carolina, and the South Carolina Bar Foundation of Lawyers would join together to help heirs property owners protect the most fundamental American right? the right to pursue happiness through property ownership. And we couldn't have done it without the guidance and support of the Ford Foundation. And so I wanna pay homage to the genius of Carl Anthony, who was our program officer. He was our champion and our guide. We went up to New York to the Ford Foundation and met with Carl and had a great opportunity to explain our work. And we were able to host Carl on a visit down here in Charleston. And he heard many of the dimensions of the problems that heirs property owners were dealing with. And as we sat there in that old community foundation office downtown, right there above the old Bluestein's menswear shop, uh, Carl summed it up with a sentence that personally I didn't fully grasp at that time. Carl was listening intently to these multiple stories and our challenges with developing a comprehensive strategy. And he said to us, what you have here is an equitable growth problem. Now, I don't know about you, Dr. Stevens. I can only speak for myself. But maybe you and our friends, Madeline McGee and Richard Hendry, got it. But I'll tell you the truth. I didn't have the faintest idea what he was talking about. <laughs> but I nodded vigorously. It was the Ford Foundation. I nodded my agreement. I said, oh, yes, we have an equitable growth problem. Yeah. And over time, with Carl's help and the Ford Foundation's support, we were able to see that heirs' property is more than just an inheritance problem. He helped us connect the complex web of issues that intersect over land that is owned by African Americans, owned by people who did not and still do not have access to affordable legal services, to people who live in rural areas and exurban areas facing uh, urban sprawl coming into their areas, he helped us guide those who face disadvantages in the property tax system, to those who've been placed on the back burner of farming support operations, uh, to those who were unable to securitize their land assets and access the mortgage market, mortgage market, the equity market, and the educational financial support, and the list goes on. It was all a different way of looking at intersectionality, but all these factors provide a very complex way of saying that with heirs' property, it's all jacked up. <laughs> what became clear to us was that it was more than a black and white issue as I'd considered it growing up. In fact, it was a black, green, white issue where we could come together and find common interests with environmentalists who shared our community preservation goals. 
We sought out the land use planning community, uh, learned all about water and sewer infrastructure, and we grappled to balance access to clean water for residents who were putting a well and a septic tank pretty close together. And we balanced that with the need for sewer infrastructure that would enable us to utilize those low lands and build a couple of houses on a family's tract of land. And so with this charge, our foundations brought in the Bar Association, the Coastal Conservation League, our Legal Aid Society, our Appleseed Legal Justice Center. We brought them all to the table to study these causes. And we engaged with real estate lawyers and judges to examine the partition sale process as our courts had been administering them. Uh, Appleseed Legal Justice Center actually brought judges together with other lawyers to train new lawyers to deal with these cases. And so, despite old thoughts, we brought a wide range of leaders from various perspectives to the table, and we all tried to figure out how the judicial and land management process could be improved for people who held property within their family. And we call this collaboration HP3, the, a the Heirs, Pro sorry, Heirs Property Preservation Project, HP3. But the title reflected our collective agreement that we would focus on the vision and the promise, not just the problems with Ayers property. From the outset, our goal was to support economic empowerment of Ayers property owners so that family members could create intergenerational wealth. And over time, HP3 became more than a project. It became a viable entity, and the Center for Ayers Property Preservation was born then and is growing, growing, growing now. The center's team accepted that challenge to combine the best of community engagement, legal services, and grassroots leadership. And many of you have relied on them for information, instruction, services, and support at the most critical of times, when hearth and home are at risk of loss, when families are falling into old disagreements and transferring that disagreement onto the land, and when you're looking for a plan that will preserve your property and take your land ownership to the next level. And so the center has been there and they are helping hundreds of landowners protect and preserve thousands of acres of land. And I'm just glad to know you. We really appreciate your work. And so that brings us to our topic this morning and that is to deal with the challenge of ameliorating the disadvantaged status of heirs property. And to do that, within our legal system. And so that's what I'd like to talk about this morning. In the quest to prevent black land loss, the center focuses its work on three buckets. First, prevention, second, resolution, and third, wealth generation. So prevention, resolution, and generation. Prevention, from the very beginning, our heirs property preservation efforts set out to prevent land loss through community-based legal education. And we provided client counseling to folks who came to these workshops all over our state. And we strongly believe that information and education could help clear up some of the misunderstandings that folks have about their property. And we took to the streets and the airwaves to launch a series of clinics and workshops that covered everything from simple wills to uh, land use planning. You might remember that old first video we produced with Ann McGill from our local news station here. And we recorded some of that video out at my grandmother's house. And we distributed hundreds, maybe thousands of copies of this thing all over South Carolina. And our, even our uh, educational television uh, group broadcast it statewide for us. These were great first efforts. But as a community, decades later, we are still reeling in confusion about Ayers property. And so from that time, I'm, I'm reminded of a story that I heard from another lawyer. I was talking about a dear senior citizen who sat through one of his workshops. And after an hour of this attorney explaining how Ayers property works, what it could do, what it couldn't do, everyone was heading out back home. And after that hour, someone overheard the, this senior walking out and she said, you know, I don't care what that lawyer said. Papa said the land was for me. Now here in this room, we know that the Papa didn't write it down. <laughs> that's not necessarily how that's gonna go down, right? But this general confusion about 
what our ancestors could and could not do with heirs property has led to dramatic loss of African American land. We are losing land in the country and in the city, on the farms, and our marshes are disappearing. And at the core of the issue is the fact that this form of land ownership, heirs' property ownership, operates really as a kind of second-rate way of owning land. Now, you may say, Professor James, what's the difference? Right? You teach property. What's the difference? As long as I've got a deed, somebody paid for it, a deed's a deed, right? Wrong. Let me explain. Now, in property law, we refer to your rights as a landowner as a bundle of sticks. And so there's some sticks on your tables in front of you. If you can grab some of those sticks, you, that'll help us understand this, right? And so each stick represents an ability to do something with your land. Yeah, yeah, and it's interesting because everybody doesn't have all the sticks, right? That's where I'm going. Right? <laughs> so one stick gives you the right to possess and occupy the property. Right? The second stick enables you to use the property however you see fit. The third stick empowers you to exclude other people from your land. And finally, the fourth stick, that last stick, grants you the power to transfer the property to somebody else. So think about it. It's not complicated. Think about when you lived in an apartment. Right? Your landlord has the right to take away that possession stick if you don't pay your rent. Right? If you live in a subdivision, uh, the homeowners association usually maintains some control over how you use that property. Right? You can't keep old cars in the front yard, and some of them even give you a ticket if the grass is too high. Right? And then when solicitors and scammers come through your neighborhood, uh, knocking on the door, you've got the right to exclude them by telling them to get off your land. Right? Don't use a gun, just tell them get off your land. Right? And last but not least, you might plan to sell your house and buy another or pass it down to your children. So each one of these sticks gives you certain rights. And some of you have four sticks. But if you hold land as an heir's property owner, the law effectively takes away some of your sticks. You've got that one stick, the right to possess and use the property, but now you have to share that one stick with all your siblings, your cousins, and even baby's kids from up north. Right? And so with heirs' property in the law, we call that a tenancy in common. Right? So we're tenants in common with the other heirs. And we all just start off with fewer sticks in our property rights bundle. Now, you might have observed that lots of people own property together, right? and they hold it as joint tenants. And they don't seem to have all these problems, do they? Well, maybe. They have some of those problems, right? Uh, joint tenants do have to figure out how to share these sticks. But there is a key distinction that has a significant impact on the history of African-American land. Right? So for joint tenants, the law pretends that if one of those tenants dies, that the other tenant owned the whole thing. The person who died, their interest just disappears like magic. And so the land goes to the last man standing. They are able to keep and hold that title all together, and then they get to decide what they want to do with it later. But heirs, property owners, we're just tenants in common. And we have an undivided fractional share interest in the property, not like joint tenants who share the whole interest in the property. It's semantic, but here's what it means. Heirs property owners end up sharing inherited property with their aunts, uncles, siblings, generations of cousins, nieces, and nephews. And so over time, Rather than consolidate our land and wealth from generation to generation, heirs' property owner shares just get smaller and smaller and smaller with every successive generation. And then, when that huge group is there, all it takes is one cousin to sell their piece of that possession stick to somebody else, and then they invite a random stranger into our ownership pool. 
Now, if that stranger doesn't know you, he doesn't care about the land, then there's no problem. But if that stranger is a developer, then you've got a problem. Right? That developer could have been trying to get your local family to sell the land for years. You might have even run them off your property. Right? But now, you don't have that stick that allows you to exclude him because he's got a piece of your possession stick. And so with the law of partition, the developer could utilize the legal system to get his piece of interest out and purchase your property that was never put up for sale. And that's where the center has made its mark. Right? The center's effort to resolve heirs property issues is critical to the preservation of African American land. You know, knowing what we know now about these sticks and the bundle of rights, nobody would ever set out and go out and say, hey, I want a tenancy in common. You wouldn't choose it. Right? But if you don't make a choice about the disposition of your assets, the state has a plan for you. And they say, we're going to break it down as tenants in common from generation to generation to generation. It's an uncertain estate. And if people are inclined to sell, it gives you a tenuous title to your property. We call that a cloud over your property. It's cloudy because you can't really see who all has an ownership interest in that land. Right? But for starters, we are blessed to come from ancestors who had the temerity and the industriousness to come up out of slavery and sharecropping they scraped and scrounged their pennies together to purchase land for our families. And so we're grateful that we're able to even inherit that. Right? But you know, before emancipation, when the Union, Union Army occupied St. Helena and the Beaufort area, formerly enslaved African Americans got busy trying to buy land. They were the entrepreneurs of their day, the root of black enterprise in our country. And they were carrying on the traditions of their ancestors whose rice cultivating skills had been kidnapped, trafficked across the Atlantic, and appropriated to families who got their land grants for free from the King of England. These ancestors were neither slave nor free, nor free, but they planted the seeds of economic hope and family security with their land policy recommendations to the United States government. And later on this afternoon, we'll get into some of that history. But particularly here in this Gullah area, on the Gullah coast of the Low Country, we know that that promise was very important. And we had more African American landowners in the state of South Carolina than anywhere else in the country. It was here where that dream was born even though the federal government offered and reneged over and over again on the promise of land ownership, and when they did sell it to us, they sold it to us at a premium cost. And then General Sherman came through and he promised freedmen up to 40 acres and maybe a mule along that plantation-ridden lowlands, but they never delivered. And so it was up to our ancestors to pursue that dream by purchasing land. Right? And we'll talk about some of the innovative things they did to uh, make that land affordable for people uh, later on this afternoon, we talk about the South Carolina Land Commission. But the beauty of it was that they were able to pass on this property. The problem was they didn't have access to lawyers to develop an estate plan. And so without a will, you're stuck with tenancy in common. And so we go from that dream of those ancestors in that war period and post-war period to a nightmare. Right? We've got to admit that this land legacy is a property management nightmare. Now, I shared with you how we go, the law goes through all these shenanigans about sticks in the bundle, but you didn't hear me say anything about the law's recommendations for how we should manage and share those sticks. I didn't say anything about it. Law doesn't give us any guidance, right? Crickets. And so even the most um, esteemed property professors, Joseph Singer, Singer one of those uh, experts at Harvard Law, summed it up this way. He said, uh, you know, for heirs, property owners, co-tenants, 
Co-tenants have to work out among themselves how the property will be used. And if they cannot agree on how the property is to be used, the main legal remedy is partition. And as they say around the way, that's when the fight breaks out. But that's where the center steps in. The center provides boots on the ground, helping families resolve heirs' property issues by clearing their titles through a variety of legal actions. Now, you don't have to wait until something happens before you go to the center for help. Right? A family can get together, make their family tree, and develop a plan for their land. And many of you in this room are doing that. That's the first opportunity to resolve heirs' property. But unfortunately, with heirs' property, there's no easy way to do anything. So resolution of heirs' property requires you to use the court process. Even when families are in agreement, You've, somebody's got to sue somebody to get the action into court. And now I fully acknowledge that it can be uncomfortable to receive legal papers. Don't like sending them, don't like getting them. But if families work together and communicate their plan, things can go very smoothly. And now on that note, if you receive legal papers that you hadn't planned for, please do not ignore the envelope. You shouldn't leave it at the post office either. Not opening a letter does not keep an action from proceeding against you without you. Because they're gonna print that same document in a little newspaper somewhere, whether you read it or not. And so the courts will charge you with having been aware of the action. So don't ignore the envelope. You don't get them back by not picking it up. Now, I am not suggesting that you sign documents that show up that you hadn't anticipated. Uh, if, any, if anything like that happens, you need to get to a lawyer fast so you can understand and make a plan. Now, if you get some of that paperwork, don't look at the court date and come to the court for an explanation. A hearing is not an information session. The judge is there to take action. So you've got to prepare in advance. And so if the heirs can get together, you can share an attorney if you're all on the same side of an issue. And I encourage you to figure out who's going to pay for it up front. Right? But get help from the center or somewhere else. Get help before you go to the courthouse. But it is the truly sad thing about heirs' property that family members get into disagreement over their land. We do some of this to ourselves. Some heirs may not want to keep covering the expenses for everybody else. Some heirs might get tired of handling all the business for everybody else. Some may want or need to get out of the ownership pool because they need the resources. But the only way out is to walk through partition. So partition is the primary method that courts use to split up co-tenant ownership pools. Judges may be able to partition the interest by dividing the land itself. And so partition in kind is an option. So for example, if you've got 20 acres and 20 heirs, you can divide that 20 by 20 and get one acre a piece, right? But math, not that simple. It's not that simple. So just like those stick rules that we were talking about earlier, the law has a principle that says that land is unique. And so within those 20 acres, some might be on the road and some might be on the water and some of those acres might fall in the box. And that can complicate things so that the math is not that simple. So if you can't figure it out, judges may say they can't figure out who should get which parcel. So I do encourage you to have a plan. Have a plan if you want to partition your land in kind. Try to have a family agreement before you get to the courthouse. If you don't have an acceptable plan, or, and this happens a lot, if there are too many heirs, say 20 people to share one acre, then the judge is going to have to send this another way. And so he may send you straight to partition by sale. Now, the results of partition sales can be tra tragic. Family farms and compounds can be up, broken up. Family elders might be displaced. 
And whether it's a mortgage foreclosure, short sale, or partition sale, nobody goes down to the courthouse to pay full price. They go there to buy bargains. And so judicial sales under exigent circumstances usually result in a deep bargain discount, meaning that the families not only lose their land, they also lose wealth along with their land. So partition sales are the primary mechanism by which heirs' property is lost. But even at that stage, thanks to the work of the center and our allies in the heirs', preser heirs property preservation community, some states now have better tools and a more fair process to handle these partition sales. So my good friends, uh, Professor Thomas Mitchell and Dean Phyllis Craig Taylor, they led our community's efforts to reform the partition process and created the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act. And we've got to thank and pay homage to the work of the late Reverend, Dr. Reverend Clemente Pinckney, who authored South Carolina's provision that gave heirs the right of first refusal in the event of a partition sale. And now all states that adopt this uniform statute have the benefit of Reverend Pinckney's genius in, in that statute. And in the past, South Carolina has also been a little ahead of the curve in that they offered the ability to partition by allotment. And when they say allotment, it just means that they could have a blend. Some people could walk out of the partition with land, and the others could walk out with money or pay money in an exchange. But it allows you to work it out without necessarily going straight to a sale. And our state Supreme Court in the early 2000s was an early adopter of the concept that judges could consider sentimental attachment and longstanding care of the property when they're trying to figure out a fair resolution to a partition action. And I'm happy to let you know that I advocated for those in the uniform statute, and now those provisions are uh, available in states that have this uniform act. So the collaborative work that we began here, up and above the old Bluestein store, has helped to shape the national response to the land loss crisis that is plaguing African American heirs property owners. Judges now have the tools to avoid partition or to split the partition through allotment and cash. And when a sale is the inevitable end of a partition, the procedures are more in line with traditional real estate practices uh, than fire sales on the courthouse steps. And this gives us a better opportunity for heirs to receive fair market value for their land. And that is the key. But to get to those remedies, Right? I said you could have a right of first refusal. You might split it between land and cash. To do that, we need some resources. Right? And if you're not selling land, if there's not enough money in the deal, a family that's looking to clear a title or to exercise that right of first refusal has got to have some administrative resources to help. And so we hope that those who are in the philanthropic community and in our government will continue to consider ways that they can support these administrative costs. And I think that given the special historic nature of this land, special provisions should be made from administrative budgets and government grant resources, or perhaps even revolving loan funds that advance these supplemental transaction costs in order to help families take care of those expenses. We do that in other closings, why can't we do it with these? And so we could even consider repayment to be on a sliding scale basis, extend it over time, or make it a personal debt instead of a debt that's attached to the land. That's where we need more creativity in this room and in the thought group that's looking at heirs' property. And so I hope that all of this will inspire us to continue to be involved in the center's third bucket of activity and that is preserving heirs' property to help families generate wealth. It's a green issue for environmental reasons, but it's a green issue as well for cash. We are looking for ways to own our land, hold on to it, and generate resources that can pay taxes and cover expenses. Right? Um, looking at ways that we can work with the environmentalists through conservation easements and sustainable forestry 
And so, you know, our whole popular culture is focused on uh, intergenerational wealth. Uh, from the TV folks in Huntsville to New York City to the halls of Congress, we're now focusing on how do we get wealth down to the next generation. And that is the charge that the center is leading the way in now. So there are other vehicles that we can use to reduce the disabilities of heirs' property using different corporate forms. But just know this, when you're looking for those sticks in the bundle of rights, as an heir property owner, you don't have them all. And so you want to get out of what we used to consider sort of a poor man's trust, right? If it was heirs' property, you couldn't sell it, right? Couldn't be mortgaged, so we thought. That's not how it is now. And so I encourage everybody to get out of that unstable form of ownership, right? Heed the lessons that the center has been giving us and work your way toward having a more secure form of title. And now the center, you're at the forefront of this national effort to help families preserve all their property. And it's perfectly on time. Because <laughs> I'm on the last paragraph. <laughs> it was well timed, well timed. But I just want to remind us that the center is really at the forefront of this effort uh, to help us all think creatively about how we hold on to our land and generate some resources and have the hope of passing something down to the next generation. It, sustainable forestry, that enables us to have our cake and eat it too, but it's hard work. So if you wanna have that cake and eat it too, I, I remember what my grandmother said, if you're gonna bake a cake, you gotta break some eggs. So let's get about breaking some eggs we get to work to understand and hold this property on for the next generation. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Jenny. Jenny has saved my marriage. <laughs> because I was so excited and enthralled with um, the tribute to her that I didn't point out to you all that handsome fellow over there in the dapper jacket, that's my husband, Perry James. And I, I, and I appreciate him very much for coming out and supporting. But she also saved my marriage because I had been walking around with some of these law articles that I have written and Perry's tired of the clutter. And so I thought maybe some of the ideas in that article would be of interest to you. And so we have a batch of them available in the, in the display area in the back. And so I encourage you to take a look or look me up on the web. I got lots of ideas and I look forward to seeing y'all this afternoon.